Hey guys, welcome to Great Learning. Machine learning is a domain that has the capability to involve in other domains out there and make already efficient processes even better, right? Now, this is only possible because of the fact that machine learning offers a variety of different algorithms that are used for their respective tasks. Now, support vector machines or SVMs as they are popularly called are a critical component of the entire world of machine learning. This algorithm is very popularly used and in fact it finds itself to be among the top list of algorithms that are super trending all the time. Now since it's this important for all of you all to know the in and out of support vector machines, we here at Great Learning have come up with this video to help you understand all the foundational concepts completely and put them to practice. Well with that, I know you guys are super excited to get started. Well what are we waiting for? My name is Anirad Rao. Let's get started. If you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, I want to request you to hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell. This is done to make sure you do not miss out on any of the new updates or video releases from Great Learning. And of course, guys, if you enjoy this video, show us some love and do like this video. Knowledge increases by sharing, right? So make sure you share this video with your friends, colleague and everyone who can make use of it. And at the end of it, make sure to comment on the video if you have any queries or any suggestions and I'll be more than happy to respond to all of your comments. Hey guys, welcome to Great Learning. Support Vector Machines or SVMs as they are popularly called are a very important part of machine learning today. As you might have read it in multiple places, Support Vector Machines is a type of an algorithm which is really trending in the last couple of years because of the fact that it can cater to multiple different tasks over multiple different domains, right? Now, machine learning itself is a domain that fits really, really well with all the other domains and it has the capability to increase the efficiency of an already efficient process and of course if you're directly comparing a machine learning uh, a very well implemented machine learning models efficiency versus doing a task manually I think you're creating the clear picture here right there's really no competition because uh, machine learning is again a very critical path to help us to get towards artificial intelligence and on any level of complexity it does things in at a lightning fast pace and it gets the job done in a really really good way right so support vector machines are really popular are really important and if you take a look at it uh, if you uh, you know analyze all the job requirements out there for a machine learning engineer or on the likes of that and most of the time if you talk to candidates who have gone to these machine learning interviews you will realize that support vector machine questions are popping up a lot and sometimes taking these uh, freshers or graduates by surprise right now ladies and gentlemen you uh, you have to make sure that you understand all these concepts thoroughly hence we here at great learning have come up with this course to help you understand support vector machines fully theoretically as well as taking a demonstration and to help you understand it practically as well right so guys my name is Anirudh Rao let's get started with this course the first thing that we're going to take a look at is the agenda of what we're going to learn right now I do understand that some of you all who might be watching this video might be very much new into machine learning or you might know the very basics of machine learning so just to make sure we're all on the same lines we're going to be having an introduction to machine learning where for a couple of minutes we are going to be discussing everything you would need to know to get fundamentally up to speed with respect to machine learning right now once you clear with all the basics we're going to dive right into the heart of the topic and we're going to start tackling SVMs we're going to understand what support vector machines are why are they so important how are they helping us how do they work what are these concepts called as kernel functions why are they required and a lot more right now once you've gotten a clear understanding of all of that uh, you will come to a stage where you will know what SVM, SVM is good at and what SVMs are not good at. So this is where we will be discussing the advantages and the disadvantages of SVMs as well. Give it a thought for a second, right? There are multiple, there's numerous advantages of SVMs, but there should be one or two disadvantages. Or in fact, there can be one or two disadvantages, which may or may not, uh, uh, you know, be on the league of what you're searching for an algorithm, right? So we're going to be discussing all of that and we're going to be taking a look at the popular applications of SVMs as well. When you take a look at it and when you think about it practically, I promise you that you have used products which are built uh, using SVMs, right? You might be using applications right now which are running multiple SVM models uh, in the back end. So we're going to discuss all of that. It's a really interesting section. And of course, at the end of this course, we are going to be diving
diving right into the heart of uh, Python and we're going to be practically implementing support vector machines to showcase to you guys how simple it is yet at the same time uh, how powerful it can uh, be in terms of solving problems and creating and putting out multiple applications out there in the domain of machine learning right all right guys with that I hope all of you all are clear with the agenda on this particular course today without further ado let's get started with the first item on the agenda all right, so without further ado, coming to the first concept on the agenda today, we have introduction to machine learning. Now, ladies and gentlemen, whenever the talk is about machine learning, you have to understand one thing about machine learning is for a fact that it has been incor incorporated so well into our lives today that it really is difficult for us to, uh, you know, tend to live without machine learning. Uh, if you want to go shopping, online shopping, you're on Amazon, Flipkart, or any of these websites, there's a lot of machine learning being implemented. You want to say, hey, I want to get away from all the technical stuff I want to sit and relax and watch a TV show on Netflix guess what Netflix uses a ton of machine learning too right everything down from even YouTube uh, uh, you know to every other uh, technology that is out there everyone wants to use machine learning in one way or another so why is everyone so interested to get on board this technology right well one of the most important things is because of the fact that we are generating a lot of data in today's world now when you take a look at it we are generating terabytes and terabytes worth of data hundreds of terabytes worth of data every single day right by the time you actually heard that sound again we would have uh, we would have had enough data generated to fill up all of our hard drives uh, you know no regardless of how many people are watching this course right now right think about it that's how much data we're generating and the advantage is that machine learning is a domain that says hey you bring me a lot of data i'll help you analyze it i'll, I'll help you assess it and i'll give you meaningful results uh, you know not not just on the lines of telling you where you went wrong in the past but also giving you insights about the future so machine learning is a domain unlike no other which will help you predict what might happen in the future as well right that's absolutely fantastic so what is machine learning machine learning basically is a domain where we try to teach uh, the machines around us and to make sure that they have the ability to learn things on their own figure out what data it is they're seeing on their own and eventually improve on their own as well right it's not like i'm teaching it once and it is every single time it's coming back to me whenever it sees something new no it is learning things it is figuring out things and at the end of the day whenever there's a chance for improvement where it can be better it is retraining itself to be that much better right so that is machine learning the overall goal you have to understand here is that the world is moving at a very rapid pace towards artificial intelligence and these domains such as machine learning and deep learning are very critical in helping us get towards artificial intelligence right it's really important for you guys to know that so you might be asking at this moment of time saying, hey Anirudh, so what is the goal of machine learning then? What are we trying to do? One goal is, is very simple, achieving artificial intelligence. Well, the most important goal is to actually get the machines to think like human beings. Now, this can be debatable, but we consider that human beings are the most intelligent beings as of what we know or as of what uh, is being portrayed, right? So when you think about it, if we are the most intelligent beings out there, you might be thinking, saying, hey, aren't there quantum computers right now? Aren't there computers which which you know even lightning pace is an understatement that's how quick the computers today are right so you might be saying hey that can can't that be very smart just because of the fact that it can handle calculations that much quicker than human beings well let me tell you for a fact that your machine at its most basic level at its most fundamental level can understand only zeros and ones so when you give it a thought uh, your computer is not as intelligent as you might think it is unless uh, for the fact that once you start training it it definitely can get better right because in our brain we have something called we have these neural channels we have these neural networks where we have millions and billions of interconnected networks which form this extremely complex system right so we are trying to sort of replicate that on a smaller scale with machine learning it is slightly closer with respect to deep learning and of course a lot more on those lines right so now ladies and gentlemen you might be asking a question saying okay so where does all the data come from uh, you know since we are talking about machine learning where i just told you and i even made a sound for you to tell you about how much gener how much data we're generating in today's world right so it becomes key for you to understand at this moment of time that it's not just the quantity of data that's going to affect your machine learning algorithms but it is also the quality of the data because sometimes you might think that, hey, I have a ton of data. Let me just push it onto an algorithm and get it to work fine. No, you must ha you must understand at this moment of time that even regarding quantity, uh, you know, there's an equal emphasis given to quality of data as well. Right. 
So now that we know what machine learning is, it also becomes very important for all of you all to understand that there are various types of machine learning that are out there, right? The various types of uh, uh, ways in which your computer gets to learn. Now we have supervised learning, we have unsupervised learning, and we have reinforcement learning. So guys, these three are the most fundamental aspects of machine learning that you guys must know about, right? Fantastic. Let's dive right into the first one, which is supervised learning. Now, supervised learning, the name sounds very familiar, right? What do you mean that, uh, you know, there's someone who's learned, who's supervised learning or someone uh, who's learning, who's being supervised, right? Just think about maybe a little kid who's going to school, who comes home for homework and the kid is being supervised by their parents or something like that, right? So what happens in the case of machine learning? I'm going to promise you at this moment of time that, uh, you know, in real life, uh, when, whenever I start giving you these examples, and I'm going to give you a ton of examples, you will understand that you have used supervised learning, unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning in your real life. You have used it, I am 100% sure, right? So coming to think about supervised learning, it's very simple, guys. Uh, take a look at the images that you have on your screen right now. I have images of flowers, I have images of dumbbells, and I have an image of a car, correct? Now, even if I had not written what it is at the bottom of the image, don't you think you could figure out what it is? 100% sure that you could, right? Why? It's because of the fact that ever since your childhood, you've been seeing cars, you might be seeing dumbbells, and I'm very, very sure you've seen a lot of flowers around you, right? So, Thinking about it, your brain has already processed millions and millions of images of what flowers look like, what dumbbells look like, and what car looks like. You would not be surprised if I would show you anything uh, on the lines of this, right? Now, if I showed you a rather red colored car or another very different model, right? Now, I am a car enthusiast and I can take a look at it. I can tell you that this is a car. This is a coupe. It looks very similar to uh, this car called as the Audi TT. And, um, you know, it is orange in color, probably a limited edition. So I can tell you a ton of it just by looking at a graphical illustration illustration, right? Now, the difference is here. If I show the same image to my computer and say, hey, computer or hey, machine learning model, what is this? Uh, if it is untrained, it's going to be like, I have absolutely no clue what it is, right? So it doesn't know what it is saying. Then you might be asking a question, how does it learn? Well, how it learns is very fascinating because of the fact that, uh, you know, you're going to use these images to uh, ascertain a position uh, for your machine learning algorithm. You're going to say, hey, here are some pictures of flowers. These are what flowers look like. So make sure that, um, you know, you're telling your machine learning algorithm that, hey, these are flowers for sure. These are 100% flowers and just start learning what a flower looks like. What are the characteristics of a flower? There's petals, there's leaves, there's various colors and all of that, right? So it starts understanding what a flower looks like. So later down the line, when you give it another image and you, and if you, and if you ask a question saying, Hey, can you figure out uh, the flower in this image? Or can you figure out if there is a flower in this image? If your machine learning model has learned really well, it will know what to look for, right? That is where all the magic of machine learning happens. Now, since it's called supervised learning, we are actually giving it the labels. We're telling it, Hey, this is a flower. Hey, this is a dumbbell. So we are giving it one sure shot form of learning, just like a textbook that your college would have given you saying, hey, here is all the information. It is correct. Please learn this and eventually, uh, you know, come replicate whatever it is that you have learned, right? That is supervised learning. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, you might have heard of this, uh, uh, you know, very simple equation, y is equal to f of x. Let me tell you that this equation actually happens to be the foundational aspect of supervised learning, right? Because when you think about it here, we have nothing but the input variable to be x and we have the output variable to be y. And all we're trying to do is we're trying to map the output, nothing but as a function of the input. So whenever you have an input and you transform that by applying a function on it, you get a certain output, right? So you're basically teaching your machine learning algorithm to do something, it has the capability to learn and eventually replicate results for you. And that is what will help you drive the output, help you create applications and a lot more, right? So that is supervised learning. One more thing you have to know about supervised learning is for a fact that it has further divisions. Just like how machine learning has three divisions, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning, we have supervised learning, which further has two more divisions, which is basically regression and classification. Now, let me tell you one thing about support vector machines at this moment of time is for a fact that support vector machines is a type of supervised learning, and it works really, really well for both the tasks of regression and classification. Now, even though it's popularly used for classification, it works really well for both. So you have, you're, you're a person who might be asking, what is regression and what is classification? Well, let me explain. 
Regression is basically us trying to understand how we can go on to predict future values by making use of past data. I promise you, you've used this. Just open up your mobile phones right now. Say, hey, Google, hey, Siri, hey, uh, uh, you know, Cortana, whatever it is. And just ask that intelligent uh, AI bot what the weather is like tomorrow. Tomorrow is not even here yet. Yet your uh, mobile knows what the weather is like tomorrow. And it's pretty accurate, right? If it says that there's a 90% chance that it's going to rain, I can. I, I have been in situations where it has rained. Every time it says it has rained, it absolutely has, at least here in Bengaluru, right? So give it a thought. You are predicting the future with regression. Think about classification. Classification is very simple, ladies and gentlemen. If I basically gave you a couple of, uh, let's just say, pens and pencils, and if I told you, hey, can you assort this based on pencils where you can keep all the pencils to the left side, keep all your pens to the right side, don't you think you can't do that? You can, right? Well, if you get your machine learning algorithm to do that for you, it's a very simple term called as classification because literally you're classifying stuff there, right? So, ladies and gentlemen, this Oops, I'm sorry, I'm going to be there. So ladies and gentlemen, this is supervised learning. And now we're going to take a look at something called unsupervised learning, which is very slightly different from supervised learning. Yet at the same time, it feels like it is completely different of how it works. Because here, take a look at it. I have the same examples on your screen. I have a couple of images of flowers, dumbbells and a car. But below that, I have no labels. I have no text. So when my computer sees this, it has absolutely no clue what it is it's seeing, right? It doesn't know what a flower looks like. First of all, it doesn't know what a car looks like. But what I'm going to get it to do is I'm not going to say, hey, use this to learn and find what happens to the others. I'm going to say, hey, figure out the structure that is present in each of these, right? Understand the characteristic of what makes a flower. Understand why a dumbbell looks the way it is. Understand what a car might look like because later when you see other images to compare, you will come to know what it looks like just because of the fact that you had learned it previously, right? So the goal of unsupervised learning is very different from supervised learning. Here we are actually getting it to understand a structure that is present in the data, which is going to act as a foundation for further learning going ahead, right? So ladies and gentlemen, you have to understand this at this moment of time that uh, when we are providing data to the machine learning algorithm in terms of unsupervised learning, we really don't do it. And, uh, you know, we really don't provide anything else apart from the input parameters that are out there, right? Just the input variables. In our hypothetical case, it's just going to be the images and I'm not even going to tell my machine learning algorithm what those images are. It has to figure out the structure on its own. It has to learn on its own and eventually give us analysis. And of course, we're going to be a lot of back and forth will be done. A lot of tweaking and tuning will be done. But at the end of the day, um, when you think about the overall picture, this is what is going on with unsupervised learning. And I think at this moment of time, you guys definitely should be fascinated with the concept of what it is that we can achieve uh, with a domain such as this and how powerful this can be going at seeing all the trends that are coming up on the horizon of artificial intelligence, right? So ladies and gentlemen, coming to the grouping of unsupervised learning, just like supervised learning, there are two types here as well in terms of clustering and association. Again, you have used both. Let me tell you how. Clustering is when you're grouping some sort of input variables with similar characteristics. Let me give you an example. If I give you a couple of oranges and if I give you a raw orange and a ripe orange, right? Orange the fruit. Uh, raw orange is going to be green in color. A ripe orange is going to be what? It's going to be orange in color, correct? So now what happens is if I tell you, if I jumble everything up and put it in a gunny bag and give it to you guys, and if I tell you, hey, can you sort this and can you keep all the raw apples to the left, raw oranges to the left side and all the ripe oranges to the right side? Don't you think you can do that? Of course you can do that, right? That is very similar to, that is very similar to clustering where you're finding similar characteristics. The characteristic here is you're finding if the fruit is ripe or raw. If it is ripe, you're keeping it somewhere else. If it is raw, you're keeping it somewhere else. That is clustering. Now think about association. Association you have used on Amazon, you've used on Netflix, right? Now you might be confused. Uh, with respect to Amazon, think of, a, think of a situation where you've just bought a mobile phone, right? There's a new mobile phone. There's a limited 12 p.m. sale as it always happens. There's a, some, something happening. There's a very popular phone. Everyone wants to buy into it. Now, as soon as you start adding these mobile phones to your cart, one important thing happens is that Amazon will start suggesting saying, hey, people who've bought this mobile phone have also bought, uh, uh, you know, have also bought tempered glasses, have also bought these safety cases that you put for your mobile phone, right? 
One question, how does Amazon know that you require? How does Amazon as a e-commerce company know that it, it has to sell you uh, tempered glass as well? It has to sell you cases as well, right? Because it has observed patterns in the past where people who have bought mobile phones have also bought tempered glass because, come on, uh, you know, we, we put tempered glass to all our phones and uh, there's no other way apart from it, at least in my box, right? So that was mobile phones. Now, let me give you a talk about Netflix, right? Netflix, again, if you're a person like me, I absolutely love to watch comedy TV shows, rom-coms, stand-up comedies and all of that on Netflix, right? Now, when I keep watching a lot of those, Netflix basically has a very, very, very intelligent algorithm, multiple algorithms, in fact, and models running on its back end. It's, it's highly powered by AI to a fact where it will, it will almost feel like Netflix is built for you. It will give you that custom-made feeling that people around the world look for, right? If you're a person who's just watching comedy, rom-com stuff, do you think it would make sense if it started recommending something like thriller or sci-fi or something which I'm not really interested to watch? No. But what if I love watching comedy and it keeps showing me and recommending me all these really nice comedy shows? I would love to watch, right? Their goal is to make sure you spend a lot of time on Netflix and at the end of the day, my goal is to find really nice TV shows that I can probably find myself relaxing too. Win, win. You see that, right? So this is literally unsupervised learning working in terms of clustering and association in real life. And as I told you, you've used products which again use this kind of technology, right? That's very important for you to understand. And next comes uh, reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is absolutely fantastic and all of y'all can relate to it if you have a pet cat or a pet dog. Now, I'm not really sure if it works with pet cats because pet cats can just scratch you in the face and run away, but it works really well with dogs, I'll tell you that, right? So when you think about how reinforcement learning works, just observe how a trainer trains a dog, right? Trains a pet dog. You might have realized that as soon as the, uh, the dog obeys the trainer's command, maybe the trainer says, hey, give me a handshake and the dog actually gives a handshake, right? He gives the dog a little biscuit. He gives it a little treat, a little reward, if you've observed very correctly, right? So why is he doing that? And what is it? What is in for the trainer and what is in for the dog? Well, the trainer wants the handshake at the end of the day and the dog wants to give the handshake because at the end of the day, it knows if it gives a handshake, it will get a little biscuit that it can enjoy, right? So from the dog's perspective, getting maximum rewards is the goal. And from the trainer's perspective, getting the dog to do the task task is very much important. Here as well, getting your machine learning algorithm to do the task for you is very important while your machine learning algorithm is hunting for rewards. But what if there's a situation where your dog does not give you a handshake? You say, hey, give me a handshake and the dog runs away. Does it still get a treat? Does it still get a biscuit? Not really, right? Similarly here, in the hypothetical situation of reinforcement learning, you have models which retrain itself continuously based on the feedback that it gets from itself, right? The goal is very simple. The goal says, hey, if there are 100 points, 100 biscuits to grab, you just find the most efficient way to grab all of those 100 biscuits, right? You're telling that to your machine learning algorithm. But not every time while it's learning, it's going to go just take a straight path to those rewards, right? No, it can get confused. It can sidestep and all of that. Now, when that happens, in this case of reinforcement learning, hypothetically, you would actually give a little punishment. Don't worry, no punishment for real life dogs or cats or pets. I'm very sure that no one does that. But in the case of machine learning, what you would do is you would assign a metric, you would assign a number, an error rate or something like that. And you would tell the machine learning algorithm, look, your job is to make sure that you can get maximum rewards and minimum errors. Train yourself in a way where you're just maximizing rewards and minimizing all these errors that are at hand, right? So this way, your machine learning is always on its best path to get towards maximum rewards. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how reinforcement learning works. So the next time you're going to go, uh, you know, the next time you're going to go give a handshake to your dog and probably a little biscuit after that, know that you're using reinforcement learning in real life. Well, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's high time we dive right into the heart of the topic, as I just told you, uh, which is introduction to support vector machine. Now, support vector machines are also called as SVMs for short, right? So the next time you uh, read a blog or something where it says SVM, do not be confused. It's exactly the same as support vector machines, right? So you might have a question at this moment of time saying, hey, so what is a support vector machine? Let me tell you that a support vector machine is basically a supervised learning algorithm that is extremely 
extremely popular in machine learning, which has the capability to perform not just regression or not just classification applications, but both. We know what regression is. We're going to be using past data to uh, predict future data. We know what classification is. If I give you a bunch of things and ask it to classify, you guys can do it, right? So that's uh, SVM has an algorithm which will do really well with both the cases. Now, that's a rare fact where an algorithm can do it really well in terms of both regression classification. SVM does this really well, right? Now, one more case where, uh, where usually a machine learning algorithm uh, will struggle is for a fact that when you have a non-linear decision that you have to make, not all decisions are yes, no, true, false, one, zero. There can be complex decisions where your machine learning model might uh, find it a little difficult. But guess what? A support vector machine has, it takes an approach in a, at a point where it is considered that it will work amazingly well. In fact, very, very efficiently when you're working with a non-linear decision, right? And one more thing you have to understand is that all the data that is not separable uh, whenever you're taking uh, the look at a support vector classifier, right? So irrespective of the cost function, you cannot uh, work on separating the data. And this has to be something very important for all of you all to understand at this moment of time, right? So I know that I've piqued your interest on it. I know you guys are curious to learn more about this. So let's take a look at a couple of brilliant images to actually visualize what it is that we are learning, right? Now, whenever you have a linearly in separable class across multiple dimensions. For example, on the left, you see one dimensional uh, linear inseparable classes, right? All these blue dots, they're one class. All these red dots are one more class, right? Now, since they're linearly put, there is no way that you can separate all of these out, right? Now, one dimension is very easy. Just draw a line, have a couple of dots, squish them in between, they are inseparable. What happens in a two-dimensional case? Look at this. In a two-dimensional case, it is still the same, right? You have certain data which is on the inside, which is clubbed, grouped, whatever it is and on the outside you have certain classes which again uh, once you start disassembling this once you start dismantling this it'll lose its meaning just because of the fact that it is linearly tied to each other right so at this moment of time this is an example to show you that hey these are some linearly inseparable classes across not just one dimension but across two dimensions right now here is where it gets interesting, right? So when, when it becomes almost difficult to separate all of these nonlinear classes, what we do is we have, a, we have a small trick that we do. This trick is called as the kernel trick that will help us to handle all these data, right? So we start transforming the data. Look at this. You can take a look at this one dimensional linearly inseparable class as we've been discussing now. And uh, once you take a look at transforming that using a polynomial kernel, uh, all we had to do was we just had to apply a couple of functions on it, apply a kernel on it. And now can you see that all these data points are split to a degree where you can have uh, at, the, at, at the initial moment of time where it was very, very difficult to separate these linear classes. Now it's done in a very simple fashion by making use of these kernels. These kernels are, are like these little helpers that will come in and ensure that we can work with data in a non-linear fashion. And every time you might think that, hey, since we're converting data into a non-linear fashion, Aren't we messing it up? In, in a certain sense, yes, but that part of messing the data up will actually work in the favor of SVMs and that's, that's, that's all the magic there's all about, right? So as you can take a look at it, the data was actually inseparable and eventually it got separated by transforming it into two dimensions. Uh, how did we do this? We applied something called as a polynomial kernel of the second degree, right? Now there's multiple kernels, there's multiple degrees of how you can apply these kernels. And in this particular case, we applied a very simple polynomial kernel and we could uh, separate a supposedly inseparable class to actually bring it to the domain of SVM and have it do its thing, right? So one more thing you have to understand understand, uh, you know, you might be at this moment of time, you might say, okay, so we saw one dimensional data. Why don't you talk to us about two dimensional data? Well, let's talk about two dimensional data, right? Again, on the image that you can see, this is, this is a two dimensionally linear, uh, inseparable class here. And once we start applying a, a, you know, polynomial kernel with a second degree on it, you can see that the transformation that happens, one part is above the uh, plane and one part is below the plane, right? So we're basically transforming the data into uh, higher dimensions to work with it. And as soon as you look look at it, you know, we have x1 and x2 and x1 square plus x2 square is basically us applying the polynomial kernel there and we're splitting each and every data point for us to work with, right? Look at this graph on your right side and look at it on the left side. What looks inseparable on the right side is actually separated by making use of a kernel, right? And this is across dimensions. This is not just the simple one uh, one dimension class that we are, uh, we are concerned or we're discussing about. This is two dimensional linearly inseparable data that we could like, you know, 
very well, very easily separate out and bring it to the league of support vector machines, right? So ladies and gentlemen, one important thing for all of you all to understand at this moment of time is you might have heard that support vector machines are a black box technique. I'll tell you why. Uh, sometimes it so happens that, uh, you know, when, when an SVM is actually working really well, there are presence of multiple unknown parameters, right? So once you start converting a lot of these, once you start working with non-linear data, there will be things which are happening, which is of no track to the SVM, but at the end of the day, it is either helping or hurting the machine learning's accuracy, right? Even an SVM doesn't know how it itself will learn completely because of so many factors that are involved, right? Now, we already saw how we separate the data out for an SVM to learn. Basically, separation for non-linear classes happens by using this term called as kernel tricks and all these parameters which require tuning, right? It's not like uh, you create one SVM model and it works fine forever for all the data. No, it, it might be a very good chance that it, it works well for one data set. The second you start using it for some other data set, it might not work really well. So what do you do? Just like how your uh, car would function in real life, you would go on to tweak it and tune it, right? There's multiple parameters. It's called as hyperparameter tuning and you would go on to do that. You might ask a question saying, how are they done with SVMs? Well, they're done by making use of kernel functions. Now, I'm going to demonstrate all of this practically for you guys at the end of the course so that, you know, all of you all are up to speed about what it is that we are discussing. Now, coming to talk a little bit about the popularity of SVMs, I have always had uh, this question asked whenever I, I talk about SVM saying, hey, why is it so popular? Let me tell you that, uh, you know, SVMs are super popular because they have the capability to handle unstructured data, semi-structured data and structured data, and it can do all of this really, really well. Now, data is of various types. There's literally thousands and thousands of types of data that you can have. And at the end of the day, expecting one algorithm to handle all of that is very difficult. But guess what? SVM can handle most of these types of data at ease. That is, that is its biggest flex. That is its biggest advantage, right? And then take a look at overfitting. Now, overfitting, for all of you who do not know, is basically a situation what happens where your uh, algorithm is digging so much deep into the data where it's, uh, you know, it's, it's almost like it's hunting way beyond its capabilities where it's seeing more noise. It is rather learning stuff which is not useful. And at the end of the day, what happens is your entire uh, performance performance of your machine learning algorithm goes down, right? That is overfitting. And guess what happens in the case of SVMs? Overfitting is actually very, very low. And that is amazing, right? So whenever you talk to statisticians where they're trying to handle underfitting and overfitting, SVM is a very good candidate over there. But there is a small disadvantage we have to also talk about is that when the case of SVMs is in discussion, since the training gets really complex, since there are multiple parameters that SVM itself doesn't know when training, and if your data set is very large, your training time is going to go up right now. Whenever we discuss any of these small use cases or sample data sets for you guys to demonstrate, it's going to work in a couple of seconds. But when you're trying to say, hey, handle a couple of terabytes worth of data, it definitely is going to take a couple of minutes, if not a couple of hours to function fully, right? So that is important to understand. And of course, it is an algorithm which is extremely popular. And I say extremely in caps, extremely popular in the domain of healthcare and in the backing sectors. If you're a person right now who's asking how how we are going to answer that in just a moment, right? Well, just before that, let's quickly take a look at this concept called as kernel functions. Kernel functions, as I just mentioned, are basically the tunable parameters that goes on in an, S in an SVM model. Now, whenever you have to take a nonlinear class, inseparable class, and you have to take it into its higher dimensions, kernel functions are the ones which are used. So whenever you have to remove the computational uh, requirement, which helps you go to that higher dimensional vector space, kernel functions are what we use, right? Now, uh, we saw how kernel functions can already help us with dealing with nonlinear separate data. As, as, as soon as you saw that we applied a polynomial function, uh, a polynomial kernel to it, we could split it out and we could work with it at ease right? So are there any types of kernel functions? Might, might be a question you might be asking right now. Well, let me tell you, yes, there are two very, very widely used kernel functions. which is basically the polynomial curve function. And the other one is called as the RBF function or the radial basis function. We're going to be using the RBF function in the demonstration that I'm going to be showing you guys, 
right so what is the polynomial kernel well polynomial uh, kernel is basically used with a degree 2 a second degree function which is used to separate non linear data by transforming them into the higher dimensions as we already saw and if you're a person who's into equations you want to take a look at the equation where uh, you know what we used to get towards the polynomial kernel well this is the equation that you see on your screen which is going to get towards that right so overall the goal here is very simple guys the goal here is to basically get towards working with your in separable data classes in a non linear fashion and to do it in a way where your svm understands that so that's polynomial kernel what is this rbf kernel what is radial basis function right now uh, even if you have not heard of rbf or even if you have not heard of race, uh, radial basis function you might have actually heard of this term called as gaussian kernel function well guess what gaussian kernel function and rbf uh, kernel functions are exactly the same thing right it has this capability uh, an rbf function has the capability to actually produce an infinite night number of dimensions if your data has to be separated out into non-linear classes it can be done right there's no limit to saying how much you can go out to separate it out and that's one of the reasons why rbf is a shining star right now you might say okay so on what basis are we going to understand how we can go on to increase these number of dimensions well it depends on a hyperparameter in our case the hyperparameter is actually called gamma and we will actually go on to mess with this gamma value we'll go on to work with this gamma value and based upon that we can tune our entire model to say that hey this data needs to be scaled out whenever we're working with especially a function such as normalizing the data because if your data is not normalized your machine learning algorithm has absolutely no clue what it is seeing or how it can relate uh, to the data in many cases right so uh, the one important thing you have to understand is that smaller the value of the hyperparameter the bias value is small and the variance gets really high right so uh, what is the other case what is the opposite case well the opposite case is that whenever you have a higher value for your hyperparameter it basically gives you a higher bias value and a lower variance value right now take a look at the uh, uh, take a look at the uh, equation that's given on your screen you can understand what it is uh, you know what the gamma looks like how it is calculated and all of that right now if you guys are complete beginners who have absolutely not used kernel functions so you might have this might be your first encounter with rbf kernel just take a note of the equation try to understand it but uh, you know going right into the depths of telling you what e is telling you how gamma why the equation came into the picture is going to be very very complex for all you beginners to understand right so just to, to keep it to the scope of everyone watching this we have to make sure uh, that you know we keep it this way right so guys it's a very simple equation i'm very sure uh, that all of you all can understand it. And if you cannot, well, let me help you with an example. Let me tell you what happens. Uh, you know, what is the impact of gamma by making use of a very simple example, right? Now, if your gamma value is very small, or in fact, let's consider the case where your gamma value is very large, right? If your gamma value is very large, uh, you will see that your overall graph is, has a broader bump, right? It's not very sharp. It's broad. It's, it's slow. It's going into these uh, higher dimensions, right? It's basically giving you uh, the, giving you this option of saying, hey, if you have a smaller value of gamma, you will actually have a very pointed bump in the higher dimensions. So if you were a person asking me a question saying, so what does gamma do? This is what gamma does. When you start messing around with this gamma value, it will basically give you a softer bump or a broader bump on these higher dimensions, which will help you work with your data in a fantastic way, right? So guys, it's a very simple concept. And at the same time, it is actually very, very foundational. And it's a very, very important part of how you can actually get uh, RBFs to work, right? Well, fantastic guys. With this, now that we have understood a lot of different things about, uh, you know, machine learning, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, uh, support vector machines and all of that, I think it's high time we dive right into the heart of the topic to take a look at the advantages and disadvantages of SVMs. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to make one thing clear at this moment of time. I am a huge fan of SVMs and we can talk about advantages for days and days together, right? But to to give you a clear and a concise view on it, here's what it is, right? First of all, you have to understand that uh, this is one of the algorithms, one of the rare algorithms which will work extremely well with unstructured, structured and semi-structured type of data. There are not a lot of algorithms which can get this bragging rights and SVM does it really, really well right and whenever you have any sort of data as i told you data comes in multiple flavors and when you're working with it of course it's going to get complex and once it starts getting complex especially for you as a programmer and as a machine learning algorithm it's getting out of hand this is where these kernel functions that we just discussed come into the picture and they will help us handle all of these data by converting into higher dimensions and helping us work with it in an easy fashion right and as, as we have already discussed another huge advantage of svms is for a fact that it 
will bring overfitting to a minimal extent. I'm not saying that there's absolutely no overfitting with the case of SVMs, but for a fact that when you directly compare it to other algorithms that are out there, overfitting that gets observed in the case of SVMs is actually very, very less, right? So that is the glory of SVMs. That is what makes SVMs what it is. But are there any disadvantages? The answer is yes. Let's take a look at some of the slight disadvantages, right? Now, one of the big things that you have to understand is that where time is of the biggest concern, right? SVMs might not be a great choice because the training time is considerably larger whenever you have to work with large data sets. You know, it's not just the training time gets exponentially added, but it's also for a fact that training these hyperparameters, during these hyperparameters become challenging because since it's a sort of a black box technique, you really will not know what is going on in the back end, uh, depending on what tweaks that you made. Now, if you know that, hey, you turn these two knobs this way, if something happens, you can be for sure. But in some cases where your data is very complex, it so happens that you're turning the knobs, but it's doing something else and you don't know why that's happening. That happens a little bit in the case of SVM right and uh, the overall implementation and overall interpretation of what your SVM is giving you is slightly difficult as I just told you because of the fact that it uses some black box approaches where there's multiple parameters doing multiple things at once and it can get confusing to you I mean that the fact that you will already have your result but you will not know why and how you arrived at those results right it's not that it's that big of a problem if you are hunting of certain specific parameters that you want to tune and especially on the lines of feature engineering and all of that where uh, you know to Tweaking and tuning one parameter can do a hell of a difference uh, for your model. You must understand that you will you will find certain difficulties to figure out why changing that little thing might have had a huge impact on the algorithm. And this in a production environment can wreak absolute havoc, right? So that's one little disadvantage of SVMs. Well, guys, now that we're done with the advantages and the disadvantages of SVMs, I think it's high time we dive right into taking a look at the popular applications of SVM. We already figured out that it's very popular on the case of the healthcare industry. So how is SVMs helping us in the case of healthcare? Now, it's such a fascinating thing that a domain such as healthcare has been brought together with a very, very radically different domain such as machine learning and we're getting these two to work really well, right? So SVMs are very popular in the case of healthcare uh, sectors where it's used to predict the condition of a patient. It can, it has the complete capability to predict the chances of any sort of dangerous disease which the person might, uh, uh, you know, might concoct, might get later on in his life or something like that, right? So one other important thing is whenever you're in the world of healthcare, healthcare is not just about accidents and fixing these accidents. It's also about creating medicines and ensuring that you have fixes for any sort of disease or any condition that might come up, right? So SVMs actually play a lot. Uh, you know, it has a huge impact in actually uh, helping us work on medicine composition as well. Probably it does a lot of things. I am not really very familiar about how things go on in the healthcare industry, but I can give you, uh, I can tell you for a short, short technical fact that, uh, you know, in the case of healthcare, SVMs are very popular in helping us actually create uh, these medicines, right? And again, it's not just about ha handling accidents, it's not just about creating medicines, but in the imaging, uh, uh, in the imaging category, wherever, you know, there's multiple images, there's MRIs, there's CT scans and all of that. Guess what? Your machine learning algorithms are it can be trained to such a good extent that it can start picking things up. For example, it has breast cancer and all of that. It can pick it up 30 to 40% faster than probably what a human could pick up, right? So it will start analyzing and assessing into your charts, graphs, and images to, to a certain depth wherein it, it has the ability to perform lightning paced computations and it has the capability to actually understand what is going on there and give you workable results based on that. And guess what? If we can save, uh, you know, again, when we're talking about healthcare, it's it's mostly the lines on the it's mostly on the lines of life and death. And guess what? If you can save someone's life by making use of machine learning, trust me, I am all in for that, right? So SVMs are very popular in healthcare. All right, guys. So just like healthcare, as I just told you, banking is another very very important application of SVMs, right? Uh, Think of this, think of it this way. Whenever there's any sort of credit at risk, right? Whenever these banks are giving out loans to people, they will have to very, in a very detailed way, assess if the person has the capability to pay the loan back. 
and sometimes it has been seen in multiple cases across the globe that they provide the loan to some person and the person fails to fulfill it. It's not just one person, it's millions of people around the globe, right? So SVMs will actually help uh, understand and it'll help you predict the nature of risk that goes into it, right? It can be low risk, medium risk, high risk. Uh, it says that, hey, if you give 10 lakhs worth of loan to this person, it's very high risk and there's a good chance that the person might not pay it back. Or if it says there is no risk, means it means that the person is very wealthy, he's probably worth a couple of crores, so giving the person 10 uh, lakhs can mean that he or she has the capability to pay back. Not that they will, we have seen that as well, but it's the capability that they can pay back, right? So assessing risk on that is very, very, very important for banks because in many cases, banks have given out loans and there have been cases where people have defaulted the, uh, you know, defaulted these loans, right? So it's very important for you to understand that SVMs is actually being put into a situation such as this and has the capability to completely help us solve that problem. And if healthcare and banking was not enough for you guys, take a look at social networking, right? Uh, in the case of social networking, as I told you, SVMs has the capability to handle large amounts of unstructured data, such as textual data. So whenever people go on to rant anything on social networking platforms or whenever they post anything, guess what? Every single post from memes to someone giving their opinion on a product or anything else can be assessed in a very, very, very detailed manner to take a look at what's happening in that area, in that demographic for that that product, for that company, for that individual, for that researcher. So basically everything right? So you can actually figure out what's happening around the entire world of social media. If you have the data and if you have an SVM to actually go on to assess and analyze all of this for you. How fascinating is that, right? This makes you think twice before posting something on Twitter the next time. Well, guys, those were the popular applications of SVMs. Now is the high time we dive right into the heart of the topic where we take a practical look at, uh, you know, solving and understanding how an SVM would work. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the goal of this demo is to not showcase to you guys of how you would write each and every one of these lines to get to the solutions, but to actually showcase to you for a fact that Python as a language is very, very easy to use and it uses extremely simple syntax and a small amount of code to do a large impact, to have a large impact, right? So without further ado, let's dive right into Google Collab. Google Collab is nothing but a simple Jupyter Notebook that I use. It's hosted on the Google Cloud platform. It's free to use and you can go on to implement the very similar thing, uh, you know, on any of your other IDs such as PyCharm or maybe another Jupyter Notebook instance or whatever you guys are comfortable with, right? So I am usually comfortable with working on uh, Google Collab as I've been doing for the last couple of, I don't know how many years. So I'm going to, I'm going to use this, right? It's very simple. I'll show you. Even you guys might uh, find a liking for Google Collab after this, right? So let me zoom in. So all of y'all can see the code. I think that's enough of zoom, right? Let me zoom out a little. Perfect. Now, ladies and gentlemen, whenever uh, you know, I'm going to tell you what we're doing basically here. So uh, in this particular demo, what we're trying to do is we're trying to pick up data from multiple different uh, uh, people. So basically what they do, what their age and their salary, we're going to pick up salary uh, from these various age groups, from these various people. And what we are going to understand as a company, think of think of it that I'm selling, uh, I'm selling a brand new company of phone. It's very popular. But what I want to understand is who my target audience is. Uh, if I if I, if I bring a phone to the market, which is probably one and a half lakhs, like how we have a couple of phones, not everyone would pick it up, right? Some of majority of the population might have a budget saying we will buy a phone, which is worth 20,000 rupees. And now you're in the market bringing a phone, which is one and a half lakhs. So you have to assess who it is for, who has the capability to buy it, who doesn't have the capability to buy it, or you just want a clear picture of what's going on in the market. It might be the other case where you're selling a 20,000 rupees phone, but the, the market is asking and the market is ready to pay maybe 70,000 for a phone there, right? Think about it. So what we'll do basically is first step is to Im import all the libraries that we're going to work with. Uh, in this case, we're going to be using three important libraries, NumPy, Pandas, and Matplotlib, as you'll see. NumPy is basically a library which is called numerical Python. It's used to perform numerical interpretations very, very easily in Python. We have Matplotlib. Matplotlib is used to plot absolutely beautiful looking charts and plots and anything on the lines of complex data visualizations. And then comes Pandas. It provides us with these two new new data structures called as Pandas series and Pandas data frames and it's absolutely a treat uh, to work with because in fact we're using our data set, we're using a Pandas data set to actually bring in the data, right? So as soon as I click this play button on the left and as you, as you saw it, it took a couple of milliseconds and it's actually done. That part of the code is already executed and ready. Now what's the next thing? The next thing is us actually taking a look at the data that I just spoke about but as soon as I click play, it's going to give me a small error. It's going to tell me, hey, where is the data set that you're asking me to open? 
Now, it doesn't have the data set because this is running on the Google Cloud platform. It's running on a cloud computing platform, but the data is in my computer. So what I am going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to just open it up. I'm going to upload it from my local C drive onto the Google Cloud platform and that uploading is done. So the next time I hit play now, things should work fine. And as you can see, uh, this is just a sample uh, five rows of worth of data, right? So what's the data like? We have a couple of users. Every single row that you see is basically one user, right? Uh, this person has a, each of these people have a unique user ID. We know that they're either male or female in this hypothetical example. We know their age and we know their estimated salary in INR, in Indian rupees that these guys are earning on a per month basis. So uh, whenever this last column says zero, it means that this person did not purchase your mobile phone. If it says one, it means that this person person purchased your mobile phone. So what we are trying to get our SVM for us to predict is sort of fact that what is the approximate salary range through which people are purchasing a phone? Can you predict? We're asking a question to our SVM saying, here is all the data of the people who have not purchased and purchased the mobile phones. Now you find me a structure and you tell me what it takes to get these people to purchase my mobile phones. That's such a profound question and the algorithm has the complete power to answer that question, right? So we're just trying to assess salaries and we're just trying to assess at this salary bracket will people buy this product or not i'll give you another example think of maybe uh the, you know uh, an upper middle class family or just a middle class family here uh, i don't think a lot of middle class families go on to buy extremely expensive sports cars maybe on the lines of lamborghinis ferraris or something like a rolls royce right uh, you need to be on a different league you need to be ha you need to have a different financial status to probably uh, own all of those cars or something like that and that's what we're trying to figure out on a simple scale here now what i am going to do is is, uh, see what we what we want we're just trying to assess the age the salary and the person has purchased this or not we're not considering any sort of gender or anything in this particular comparison and the user id is of no use to me i'm not trying to find out what one user did i'm just trying to find out what everyone did based on age and salary so these two columns that you see user id and gender i can remove everything i can remove all the user ids i can remove all the genders and i can have just age and estimated salary to train and eventually when it has trained to verify i can use the last column there right so all we're trying to do is this we're trying to filter it out we're trying to retain the age and the salary columns when we're removing everything else the next thing when it comes to machine learning is for a fact that you're going to take the take all the data that you have and you, you you're not just going to give everything to it right it's almost like saying i'm going to give you a textbook and sit and use that textbook to write your examination it's not going to be fair you might have not learned anything yet you can score 100 right but what if i tell you hey uh, use your uh, textbook yesterday or take two days before your examination sit and study nicely and come tomorrow close your textbook recall from memory write an examination that's how things work right and when i do that it will i can completely assess if the person has learned anything or not. Similarly, I can assess if the machine learning model has learned anything or not by splitting the data into two pieces, giving it one piece to learn and me holding one more piece and telling you that, hey, once you have learned everything, no, I'm going to give you this to verify if you have learned anything or not, like an examination or a test that your lecturer would give you in college. So basically, as soon as I run this piece of code, what's happening is that I'm splitting the data into two pieces. One is a training data set. The other one is a testing data set. The training data set consists of 75% of data that it's going to use to learn, that the uh, algorithm is going to use to learn. And eventually 25% of the data, which it will never see until it has completed learning. And I'm going to use it to verify. It's like a test I'm giving to verify if it has learned anything or not. Now, why 75 to 25? Well, there's not really a golden number out here. You can try out various, uh, uh, you know, you can try out various splits. On an average, it really works well if you have somewhere around 60 to 80% of data for training and the rest for testing purposes, right? Now, in this case, I've set it for 75% of training because I can specify here in this parameter where it says test size equal to 0.25. All I'm telling you is that, hey, regardless of the entire data set, remove 25% of it and put it in a separate data set, call it as the testing data set, right? Simple. The next step is again, two or three very simple uh, lines of code where all we're trying to do is we're trying to use something called as a standard scalar and we're trying to bring uh, all the data in towards a normal distribution. In a normal distribution, what happens is we have a variance of one and we have a mean of zero in many cases, right? So we're trying to distribute the data in a point on a common range where your SVM understands what's going on with that particular data and eventually help it to start, uh, you know, connecting the dots, the part where it starts to connect the dots and it figures out 
about what the data is that's one of the critical reasons why we require standard scaler right again uh, two simple lines of course in fact you might have seen this line which says from sk learn import this sk learn or scikit learn as it's called is again an extremely popular extremely popular uh, library for machine learning in python uh, i definitely would want to say that it is the most critical library because without sk learn there's a lot of things you could not do with machine learning easily right now that i've learned it uh, now that i've actually executed this three simple lines of code our data is scaled such that the machine learning model has the capability to understand the next thing is where you are actually trying to build the model we are trying to perform predictions on it right look at this to act this is this is the exact step where your entire machine learning things work for for someone who has never used machine learning if you're watching this course you might think that hey do i require 50 100 lines of code to get it to teach get it to learn not really. This one line does all the magic, but to get towards this one line, we have to, you know, spend another couple of five, 10 lines to get to it, right? Now, it's not even a long demo, but it's do, we're doing a lot here. Now, as soon as I run this, uh, first of all, you can see that we're sending in the training data for it to learn. This is the step where it's training. And next, this is the step where it's predicting, where I'm giving it the testing data and I'm giving it a test right then and there. Now, as soon as I run this, again, a couple of milliseconds and it's done. So, as soon as we start printing the report, uh, you know, for all of y'all who might not know this, it's called as a confusion matrix a confusion matrix is basically a statistical uh, result of us it is basically telling me uh, that you know there are four cases of where uh, your machine learning model is correct but your data might be pointing the other way or your data was incorrect and your machine learning uh, 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 model try to predict it something i'm going to give you an example if a person actually has diabetes uh, the person goes to a doctor and the doctor says don't worry you don't have to take any medicine you don't have diabetes that's a wrong diagnosis here is where you can also have a case where your machine learning will them can wrongly predict stuff uh, uh, to give you one more example think of it that a person does not have COVID-19 the person absolutely does not have any sort of uh, symptoms of COVID-19 randomly goes into a hospital wants to get tested and the result comes positive in that case, what do we say? It's a false positive, right? The person does not really have COVID-19. Now that person is going to shut himself in his room for 15 days for no reason, right? That's also a wrong diagnosis. So basically with this case, uh, you know, there are four cases. You have the false positive, you have the false negative, you have the true positive and the true negative. These four values will basically tell you if your machine learning algorithm has been predicting stuff correctly or if it has been predicting stuff incorrectly, right? You can actually predict and print a direct accuracy score here, but to give you guys a picture a taste of what a classification report would look like we have multiple uh you know multiple terms multiple metrics that we track it's called precision recall the f1 score and support where through this core uh you know through this particular simple explanation we can understand for what cases uh, uh it's predicting really well for example there's almost the precision is 96 percent to predict when a person has not bought the product when a person has not bought the mobile phone and there's somewhere around 88 percent of accurate prediction when a person has actually bought a mobile phone, right? So you can find out a lot of things. You can find out accuracy. Overall, there's an accuracy of somewhere around 93%. You can find out the macro average, the weighted average, the recall, the F1 score, the support, and any other metric of accuracy that you would like to basically assess saying, hey, how well did my support vector machine do, right? You can answer all of that. And as you can see, right, let me quickly clear all the outputs here. I know you might not be able to see the code. I've zoomed out. My point here is as soon as I start zooming out, look at this. We, we didn't use a lot of code, right? We have taken an entire use case. We have understood a data set. We have solved the problem and we have eventually even tracked and analyzed what the result looks like. And we have done this in what? 25 lines of code. Everything in 25 lines of code. That is the power of Python. That is the magic of machine learning. And of course, that's the enchanting world of support vector machines. So guys, with this, we have come to the end of the course. Thank you so much for watching. To quickly summarize everything that we have learned, we started this one out by basically taking a sidestep and understanding everything we need to know about the basics of machine learning. Once we understood the basics of machine learning, we dive right into the heart of support vector machines. We understood what it is, what it does, how it works, where it works well, where it does not work well, right? And then we understood that we really need to take a look at and understand the term called kernel tricks, kernel functions. We took a look at that to a good amount of detail using a lot of examples through which you guys can understand. And after we understood how data is worked on with a on a non-linear fashion, where we can transform it using polynomial uh, functions, RBF kernels and all of that. Uh, after that, later at the end of it, right? What we did was we took a look at the various applications of uh, uh, you know support vector machines 
things, we also made sure to take a look at the various advantages and the slight disadvantages, in my opinion, of this very popular algorithm support vector machines. And after that, we dived right into the heart of the code. Uh, we, we took a very simple use case, yet even though I made it seem very simple in a real world scenario, that is exactly what would happen. It would be a very, very complex data set consisting of millions of entries, right? So we took a, we took a look at that data set. We got our SVM to work really well, very good accuracy scores. We had a lot of ways for us to personally assess and understand what's going on with the SVM model and a lot more, right? So guys, I hope everything that I have covered in this course is clear to all of you all. As always, thank you so much for watching. My name is Anirudh Rao and I'll see you on the next one. If you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, I want to request you to hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell. This is done to make sure you do not miss out on any of the new updates or video releases from Great Learning. And of course, guys, if you enjoy this video, show us some love and do like this video. Knowledge increases by sharing, right? So make sure you share this video with your friends, colleague and everyone who can make use of it. And at the end of it, make sure to comment on the video if you have any queries or any suggestions and I'll be more than happy to respond to all of your comments.